All right, um, so we're here from Project Gato, and uh, I'm Tom Smith. I'm Brendan Ebers. Robert Douglas. Alex Neville. All right, so Project Auto actually starts with a place, um, and this is the Afro-American newspaper. It was founded around 1890. Um, it's the oldest African-American oh. paper in the country. Um, and you can imagine that over the 120 years that this paper has existed, they've accumulated some pretty incredible history. Um, they have photographs ranging from World War I up to the Civil Rights era, um, very, very strong, sort of 1920 to 1970. But the Afro has a problem. They have, by a conservative estimate, one and a half million photographs in their archive. Um, and they have one archivist, this is John Gartrell. He does a fantastic job organizing all of these files from the paper's entire history. But of course, if you've got one um, person handling all these materials, his main effort is just to keep them around. Um, and nowadays, that's not enough. If you want scholars to use materials, if you want people from the community to be able to see their history, you really need to have things in a digital form. But when you have one guy just trying to keep it all from falling apart, and low resources to be able to do digitization projects, that's nearly impossible. So in 2010, Project Gato started up uh, with the goal of creating an open source archival scanning robot, uh, which small archives, museums, or even individuals can use to digitize photographic materials cheaply, easily, and automatically. Um, we're funded by the Abel Foundation and uh, the Johns Hopkins Sheridan Libraries, and what we built is what you see in front of you here, uh, this is the Gato 2. It is a, uh, an archival scanning robot, completely open source, so we're going to demo and talk a little bit about today. Um, we've been working at the Afro-American newspaper, uh, digitizing in their collections as our first partner. We've done about 30,000 photographs so far, so a huge, huge improvement over what they had. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Brendan, who's going to talk a little bit about the hardware that we developed to be able to do this. Uh -oh. So this is a, a picture of the robot down here in the bottom corner. And you might notice that it doesn't look like an autodoc scanner. Uh, as Tom mentioned, these photos date back to 1920, and they're very fragile. So what this is, it's essentially just a big rotating arm with a suction cup at the very end that gently uh, lowers and lifts an image from an inbound pile, places it on the scanner that we see right here, and then drops it on an outbound pile. So. You'll get to see a demo in a moment of how it works. But right here at the very heart, the brains is an Arduino. Um, for those of you who might not be uh, into too much prototyping with your electronics, it's a microcontroller that's pretty easy to use and program. And we have a custom shield on top of it that actually manages all of the hardware that's on this robot that you see. Uh, all of these plastic components we prototyped with a MakerBot that we got courtesy of NCIIA. The NCIIA. Thank you if anybody's here. <laughs> and it, yeah, we'll show you in a minute. So I'm going to hand this over to Robert, who will talk about the software. All right. So the robot's all well and nice, but you need some software to run it. Otherwise, it doesn't do too much for you. Um, in our first iteration, the software was a bit of a kludge. We had to actually use the command line just to throw the commands to the robot to control it manually. Um, we were really aiming for some speed and efficiency improvements with this version. So the software got a whole bunch of work. As Brendan mentioned, there's an Arduino at the heart of the uh, robot here, and it has a custom version of firmware that we wrote, and it uh, accepts serial commands from the USB line going uh, directly into the computer running the Gato control software. Um, again, as Brendan mentioned, this is all open source, so you can actually go to GitHub, um, and all of our source code uh, for the application, the firmware, all the designs are all online, so you uh, can feel free to download it. Um, here is a uh, working image of what the interface actually looks like, and it's a pretty big improvement of what we had previously. Um, you can see here that it both scans and takes an image of the back of the picture here with a webcam. That way we can go through um, and use some optical character recognition to pick out any kind of metadata. Um, and that really helps the archivists um, go through and you know, better organize their collections. Um, as far as the uh, scanner is concerned, we're using the Wim uh, Windows Image Acquisition Library, uh, which really facilitated the use of a broad range of hardware. So if the scanner is compatible with Windows, uh, it should be able to work with our setup. And uh, now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brendan, who's going to give you a brief demo of the robot. Actually, Alex can talk through it. Yep. Oh. I guess it'll be me instead. <laughs> so uh, Brendan here is using our new software, which is all GUI-based, rather than the, uh, the terminal-based software we had previously in the archives. The first thing it does is it takes a picture of the back of the photograph, and then the arm gets set to lower and prepares to lift the photograph. It detects that it has the photograph by a little touch sensor here. 
it just clicks on when it actually has the photograph in its grip. We formerly used a light sensor. We had some problems with images that had dark surfaces on the back. It got false positives on that and it would lift up before it touched the photo. This one seems to be working out pretty well for us. Uh, it's lowered the image onto the scanner. This is the part where it would actually do the scanning. We would have then back of the image, front of the image, and it would just drop it off over here. Now the uh, software we have is designed such that you can calibrate where it's going to drop off the photo, where it's going to pick them up from, the height of your scanner, and it's also set up so that you can enter in metadata information based on the location within your archive. Say, for the Afro, what room it's in, what shelf it's in, what particular box of photographs it's in. Very handy for archivists. And the important thing to point out here, too, is that this would be going while the archivist was doing their other work. Um, so at the Afro, John Gartrell can go and do his really important work in understanding the collections while this is basically sitting and digitizing in the background. So before, where you had somebody manually flipping photographs, now the archivist is freed up to do the kind of work that they're really trained to do instead of being the manual digitization person. Hmm. Um, so I guess uh, at this point, uh, I'll mention a couple other things. Um, all of the images that we've digitized at the AFRO are available on a website, Gado Images, G A D O Images.com. Um, and on that site, you can browse through the whole collection and see some of the really incredible stuff we've been getting there. Again, you know, we've got uh, Civil Rights era, really strong, World War II, just some really remarkable photographs coming out of that project. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that, as these guys have all said, this is an open source project, and we actually have a kit available now for anyone who wants to assemble one of these themselves. We call it the IKEA version. It's got instruction manual. It snaps all together. Uh, really simple to put together. You don't need any soldering skills. You don't need any other kind of expertise to be able to assemble it and use it in your own archive if you're an archivist uh, at your own institution or even in your own home if you've got a lot of family photographs you want to be digitizing. Um, so let's see. Uh, this information, let me go back. This is the information for the project, projectgato.org. You can follow us on Twitter at Project Gato. Um, Facebook, or if you want to email and get more information. Thanks to a grant from NCIIA, the first few kits are pretty much at cost. Um, and I'm going to move on and take questions. Take questions. Great. Good job. It was uh, truly the IKEA version. You call it like the Nikolakan. I'm sorry, that's my <laughs> bad Swedish right there. Um, you mentioned the webcam to take the picture of the back. How does that work? Is that on the robot, or is that a separate webcam? Um, it's actually plugged into the. U oh, there we go. It's actually plugged into the USB port here on the computer, so the control software is able to control the webcam programmatically and uh, take that image and store it alongside the scanned images. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have any? Uh, can you handle moving film? Can you handle eight millimeter, sixteen millimeter? Obviously not. Um, at the moment, we're focusing mostly on the flat materials. Um, but really, this same platform can be modified. And again, since it's open source, anything that requires that kind of material handling where you're lifting something up and placing it down, you could modify the basic platform to handle that. Um, if you're working with a film reel where you're going to have to actually move it through uh, you know, some kind of digitization aperture, that might be a little more difficult with this setup. It's geared more towards those flat materials, but again, Open source, you know, you can take this, everything's out there, the, the plans for the PCB, the plans for the machine itself, and modify it uh, to whatever you need. Are you guys interested in developing that kind of modification? We're still looking at uh, what direction we're going to go next in terms of the uh, capabilities. Microfilm's been something people have brought up a lot, negatives, mm -hmm. um, and uh, flat documents that aren't necessarily uh, photographs. Cool. It's easy enough for a... Um, for the archive is to put in like a barcode or something in the stack so that when, when it comes up, they've got a way of figuring out what was in there. Do you have anything worked into the software that'll automatically group, timestamp, something like that? Uh, we're, actually, we're actually using a, a barcode at the very uh, end of the stack of images. The webcam picks up on that, and that's fed into the software to let us know that there's an end of a stack. So the software is pretty easily modifiable. If it detects a different sort of barcode, a different sort of tag, it would be able to switch over to a new folder. So that's not currently in there, but all of the underlying framework is there for that already. 
QR. Um, granted, you have a big enough scanner. Do you have a size limit on what, the, like, some, the size of something? Some it, it can lift successfully, or is how does that work? It can lift up to five pounds. As for the size, I don't think we've tried past eight and a half by eleven. Yeah, actually, my first question was, does it do eight and a half eleven by eleven? But my other question is, does it? have a function where it takes all the stuff that it's pulled out of the stack and puts it back in the stack where it belongs? Yeah, I was just going to mention um, rehousing is one of the, obviously, the big challenges in an archival environment. Um, at the moment, when we're, we're dealing with the materials at the Afro, we're able to rehouse in the order that it puts the, the photographs down at the end. That's not a problem. Um, you could certainly modify it to do a second run so that it would go back and sort everything back into the original order. Um, for us, it's not a problem, you know, for their process, so we don't uh, add that extra time. But it would be a, a simple modification, probably what six lines of code to send it back and to have it replace them in the same order. I noticed the pressure that you put on the socks, and I was wondering if you talked to somebody from the archive um, or whatever to see, you know, when it's really old photographs, what is the right amount of that you can use without damaging? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We've talked to um, people at the Afro, but also at Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland. We've been working with the um, Maryland State Archives um, on basically figuring out exactly what, uh, what's appropriate. And also, um, one thing we can mention about the hardware is that the level of suction can be varied to pick up different materials. I think we're running it at a full blast today just so that we can make sure it works in the demo. But you can basically dial in exactly the level of suction um, and again, the amount of pressure it's applying is minimized by that touch switch. You can even go lower using the light sensor um, that Alex had mentioned, where you're not applying any more physical pressure. That's easy to add into the device. Um, for us, it's better with the materials we're working on at the Afro to have more reliability um, with a little bit more pressure. But if you were digitizing something much more fragile, uh, certainly you can vary it. And we have a great team of archival advisors uh, that we've been able to consult with on those kinds of questions. And that's certainly a, another modification, having multiple lifters. Great. You guys did a great job. Hopefully you can keep you here, <laughs> seeing some cool stuff. Open source hardware rocks and software. So uh, moving us right along. Thank you very much. And I guess the, the robot will be here. Yeah. So the robot will answer questions later.